the moment uh, the moment I was sold on Erlang was the moment I heard Joe explain that to program for a um, but because we are all parallel, we have to program for a concurrent world. Um, and, and when I heard that, when I, when I heard him talk about how we are parallel, we talk, we send messages, um, the, the first thing I thought was representational faithfulness. Um, now, that says faithful representation because I was trained under a different accounting model. I was trained under this called conceptual, this is conceptual statement number two. Um, the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, when they were founded in 1973, short after, produced this conceptual framework. CONTU sets forth c concepts, which then lead to uh, give us objectives and directives so that we can then derive laws, rules, and regulations um, from them. Um, and this is how uh, they decide how our conceptual, how our financial statements um, should be uh, ultimately displayed. Um, in, in 1999, the International Accounting Standards, or sorry, in, in the 1990s, the International um, Accounting Standards Board was formed um, at, for the purpose of having a uh, worldwide um, set of standards that uh, other countries in Europe and so forth could follow. Um, and in, Finally, in 2010, they uh, brought together the two models, um, what was needed for international standards, what was needed, needed here in America for our financial accounting standards um, in concept statement number eight. So what you're looking at right here is the foundation of what derives all our rules and regulations. This, this is it, this is the, this is the part, and this is the heady part of it all. Um, and, and so why, why should you care about this as Erlangers? Um, I believe that I'm looking at a room of accountants, but you guys don't know it, or, or at least nearly accountants. Uh, we, all, we all use immutable data to uh, look at, um, at immutable data with Erlang. Uh, we're always constantly logging information, and you're all sitting in this room about to learn WX Erlang, uh, which is a way of depicting data. So uh, I, want to, I want to briefly look through this conceptual statement number eight. Um, then I want to go into uh, my story of how I found WX Erlang. Uh, along the way, I want to talk about how a newcomer can get into Erlang um, and how I found trouble uh, on, on my way. Uh, then I want to go over a whole bunch of facts in no particular order with WX Erlang um, and then go over a bunch of examples of how you can uh, program WX Erlang, and, and we can go through a bunch of scripts and we'll actually tear it apart. And by the end of this, everyone here will know how to make a WX Erlang application uh, and get it up on their desktop. Um, uh, okay, so this is concept statement number eight. Um, uh, viewed through the lens of Erlang, um, or viewed through the lens of this, Erlang can be looked at as a measurement tool. Um, so what do we have here? D uh, if we're gonna record information, uh, we want it to be, uh, we're going to record information that we want to have to make decisions from. That's why we, we keep it around, so we can look at it and make decisions. Um, at that point, we want to make it go, uh, we want to make sure that the information doesn't cost more than it does uh, to record it. So that's called the pervasive constraint, and that is uh, on, on all the data. I mean, you can't record all, all the data. We have to pick and choose the one we want. So, and this all seems very generic, have you? But that's, that's the point. These are high-level generic concepts that help stem our objectives. Um, if we're to program Erlang, we want to be able to program Erlang together as a group. This is, this is what's going to happen. We're all going to build little parts, and we're actually going to, we're going to throw them together, and then we're going to have a, an environment in which we all develop. Um, and, and given that we do so in a relevant and a, in a uh, representationally faithful uh, manner, then I believe we, we could go on the right track of actually truly observing what data is. Erlang has this unique ability that it, it tends to abstract um, the truth. It, it forces you to look at the truth. Um, you, because you're looking at the binary, you're not looking at some table or intersection of things with a multivariable um, um, layout. You're actually looking truly what's happening through the wire. 
And that's one of the reasons that makes it so great. It's, it's faithful to, the, to its own representation. Um, we're looking at data looping around when we're looking and using Erlang. Um, so, so what's relevance? Um, uh, relevance is capable of making a difference. Uh, it's broken into predictive value and confirmatory value. Predictive value is, a, is inputs. Um, I, I think it's defined as um, anything that can be used as an input um, to, to use for predictive value. But for us, I mean, inputs are arguments. So it's essentially arguments and return values. Um, and we can both we can all know how that's highly relevant when we're actually programming. We're, that's what we do. We, we put the arguments and we look for the return value and we kind of pull it apart in the center. Um, that's how we make relevance. Um, on the faithful representation side, um, oh, which is my favorite definition of all time, it's uh, the phenomenon accurately purports the phenomenon. It's the vaguest thing in the world. I love it. Um, it has to be complete, which is everything that needs to be there should be there. It needs to be uh, neutral, which is without bias. Uh, if you come into a problem and you have bias, you, you might actually delude yourself, uh, oh, sorry, elude yourself, and you might um, not dilute yourself to uh, a solution that's less of what you could have made um, by looking at it from a truly unbiased point of view. Um, don't bring your pre preconceived notions. And it has to be free from error, which also means omissions. Um, so it has to actually, you can't leave anything out. It's not just that it crashes, it's that, um, or throws an exception. It, it actually has, things are omitted from the problem. That'll, that'll create problems. Um, on, on the bottom, um, I want to start with verifiability because verifiability me, def, is defined as consensus amongst peers. And this sounds a lot like blockchain. It, it's almost, if you look at blockchain and you hear this question, oh, what's this, what's this cryptocurrency worth? And what's this cryptocurrency worth? Well, they're all just verifiability in different ways that the, um, the users, the people who make these blockchains are attempting to purport. If, if one of the computers, don't forget, um, of the, has more control over the general ledger than the other computers, then they can just reprogram that general ledger. And so verifiability, that, and that's, that's truly the value of blockchain, in my opinion. Um, Kurt, simple. Um, comparability uh, is, uh, you, can com oh, you can compare two values. Um, if uh, it makes any sense, <laughs> you guys have all seen this before. Um, one of the first times I met Joe, uh, I asked, uh, is, there, is there a reason, is there an order to the way that our terms are, are lined up here? And uh, you know, he thought about it and he said that it doesn't matter in what order they are as long as they're comparable. Um, and, and that's what you see here, the greater and less than signs. Um, you know, um, comparing, we have an order to our, our types. Uh, timeliness is simply, you know, I can't invite you to lunch after I've gone to lunch. It's the, if the information isn't in your pocket in a timely fashion, you can't do anything about it. Um, it adds to relevance the same way verifiability adds to representational faithfulness. I'm going to keep saying that. I'll, I like the old term. Um, and understandability is why we're here. This is the WX Erlang part, uh, where we depict information and we let the user make a decision off of the way we depict information. So. You know, we're sitting here trying to learn what is, how can we depict information in an understandable manner for the user to, um, uh, to use it and make relevant you know, decisions uh, that are capable of making a difference in a representationally faithful way. Um, so I, I came out of college in, uh, in 2010 and I, uh, I wanted to make a product um, after working for my family accounting firm for a while. And, uh, you, you come up with an idea that you, you, you find a pain. Pain point for me was entering all my receipts tediously into Excel. Um, and uh, I wanted to make a, a system I called contra expense eventually. It's an accounting joke for anyone, um, if anyone gets it. The <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was simple. You take a picture of the receipt and uh, it streams into your accounting system. I think QuickBooks just came out with it a, a year or two ago. It angers me when I see it on TV now. Um, uh, but the, um, but as I started, uh, what I did was I, you know, I did the basic stuff. I got a team. I, um, I went and I, I, did, I didn't know programming at this point at all. I just knew what I wanted to do. I'm, you know, I was good at design, so I made a bunch of slides of the different screenshots. And I said, this is what I want this screen to look like. This is what I want this screen to look like. Eventually, I wrangled one of my friends who was a programmer to pick a zero over coffee. And he sat me down and he said, okay, the first thing we need to do is define classes. And I go, What's the class? And he starts to explain how we're going to build 
the, my program out of things called classes. Um, to anybody who doesn't know what a class is, and again, this talk is directed to people who've never learned Erlang before, um, we're, we're going to get to in a second um, how to get it on your computer. And if, um, uh, if, if all the professionals in the room uh, are patient with me through that, I'll give you guys all a present at the end of the talk. So um, you know, something to look forward to if you let their, the newbies learn how to install it via Homebrew. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I, I went and oh, yeah, I was going to the class structures. Okay, so uh, what's a class? Um, it, it's simply a group of properties, and these properties inherit from uh, their parent class or classes above it. Um, what you're looking at is the class structure for WX Erlang right now. Um, uh, take a second to look at it. Um, WX, an object is on the, on the left, and the class structure is, uh, the, or so the parents are on the left and the children are, are on the right. So the simplest classes are on the left and everything on the right inherits from the properties on the left. Um, and this is how, if you do object-oriented programming, you build everything. Back then, I did not know that. Um, and it's bigger, too. This is the bottom portion of it. Um, this is WX Erlang. It's a, uh, it's, it's a large behemoth of a piece of software. Hmm. OK. So, um, so we did all that. We, we created a sales pitch. Um, we, Oh, what do we do next? Uh, we, we tried to create the class structure. I think we've, we created something where we're storing um, uh, pictures in a folder, and we're going to then try to parse them eventually. Um, uh, but, but the point is that it, it slowly fell apart. I, I failed. I failed miserably at making this thing. Um, you know, we, made, we even made like the venture capital presentation. We never used it. Um, it's tough to keep a team together when you're building something of, of this fashion because you have to do it all at once. You have, to, you have to get everything together and then you have to say, oh, let's do it, and you have to push, and I think people have to crack the whips. And I think this is the way of object orientation, and that's why you need so many programmers looking at all the edge cases. There's, because when you're building with inheritance, you, if you make a mistake, you, you can't build it organically. I mean, it just cascades, and immediately you have dependencies growing from it that depend on the parent data, and then you have to rewrite these large swaths of it. It, it, I don't think it works. I don't think it works at all. And um, so after, after failing on that, I went and uh, uh, did accounting for a year, just kind of thinking, what do I do next with this? And I said, eventually I said, you know what, I have to, the, the, you know, the, the more I talked to programmers, the more I realized that whoever I talked to, they didn't try to solve my problem. They didn't say this is the right way to do it. They said, they didn't tell me anything about the language they were going to use, and then they tried to get my contract. And once they, once they got my contract, I realized they were just going to program in whatever they knew how to program. They weren't actually going to care about my problem and actually you know, um, fix it or actually do it right or help the world. They just wanted to pump out the software. Um, and I said, you know what? I, I can't be the one who, if I choose anybody before I choose the language, I'm going to fall victim to one of these, these um, you know, out outsourcers who just outsource the problem and then they charge you to ten, twenty thousand dollars and then you're left with a piece of abandonware a couple years later. So I said, no, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go solve the, the language problem. So I started looking at languages like anybody does, went to Wikipedia. There's about fifty. To anybody who doesn't who's never done this, um, do it. Uh, there's a lot. There's 50. I know you have to spend a couple of days looking through Wikipedia, memorizing. There's these things called paradigms, and you have to jump into the, the technical jargon. But after a while, you're going to see a pattern. You're going to see, um, you're going to see history and the way that different languages evolved over time. Um, our, our Erlang and Elixir, or the, the, they were born around 1987-ish with all the other functional languages in a little group. Um, the, the C++ and those were also born in a little group. Um, so um, yeah, the, the, anybody out there who's, who's a newbie, go do that. It, it takes some time, but it's really worth it. So, so I did that, and um, one of my program, or my friends from college, I called him up, and he said, yeah, go, go check out a language called Erlang. I'll thank you like, I think you'll like it. So I went and I checked it out, and that's when I saw Joe. And that's when I said, you know, oh my god, representational faithfulness. This guy gets it. He's actually trying to mimic what the world's doing through, through language. Um, and I was hooked. I, yeah, like I said, I came out to the first conference um, immediately, and I just tried to eat as much as I can. But it was tough. It was tough for the couple months. It takes, it takes a while to get into Erlang because you have to put in your sweat before you see 
any problem. And so why I'm here up, up on the stage is, well, I, I think it's much easier for all beginners to get into Erlang through WX Erlang. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to show you how to boot, up a, uh, boot it all up. And um, yeah, that's what we're going to do right now. So uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so this is, this is the problem with object-oriented languages. When you, uh, when you carry them around, you have to carry around that large swath of class structure on everything, which each instance that you duplicate. Um, uh, over one second, I'm doing this in an interesting way. There's, uh, where's my Safari? Bah, it's hidden down here. Okay, so if, if you've never done Erlang um, or uh, programming before, you're gonna need a text editor. Uh, go download Sublime Text, okay? Um, and again, bear with me and you guys will get a prize, okay? Go here and, and get Sublime Text. Next, go to Homebrew, do this stuff. Install Homebrew. Homebrew is a package manager that's gonna let you um, install a whole bunch of applications and all the languages on your computer. Um, and this is for Unix-based systems, have you? This is not a Windows um, uh, thing. This is a, a Macintosh and other Unix-like systems. So if you have a Mac, you're in luck. Um, so this is a package manager. Go install Homebrew. Go read the manual. This is the tough part if, you're, if this is the first time. It, it, you'll get through it. Um, brew install Erlang, type that in, and then brew install Elixir and get them both on your computer. It will install the dependencies and then open the Erlang shell by typing ERL. Uh, persevere, get through it. If you get to that point, make your way to Ferd's page. Um, learn you some Erlang for great good. I think everyone in this room learned Erlang through learn you some Erlang for great good. Um, it's a fantastic um, tutorial. Um, oh, and also go grab iTerm2. The iTerm2 is, um, it's not that, it's a little better than Terminal. It's better than Terminal. Just go, go download that too. That's worth it and join the Erlang mailing list. And if you can do all those things, uh, you know, you'll be able to get Erlang and Erlang shell, which is an instance of the Erlang runtime system up on your computer. Um, uh, from there, uh, let's jump into, let's jump into WX Erlang. Okay, enough of the introduction. Where's my main? Okay, so this is a WX Erlang application. Um, this is a minimum WX Erlang application. This is all you need to run WX Erlang. Um, I'm going to do that, okay? And what this guy does right here is it does this. It'll boot up an empty window, window right here, okay? So what's happening? Um, the start, you can see there's a wrapper on that, and then the WX new starts up a server, a WX server, which is this little, this Erlang guy down here, this, uh, this little symbol. Um, it's, it's an instance of the server. Um, next, it, you start a frame, which is a fancy way of saying this window right here. Uh, you can give that a title, and um, you have to feed it the server. And from this, this becomes your top level window. It automatically creates a top level window, which is if this guy dies, the whole instance dies. Boop, it's all dead, okay? Next is, so we'll start that back up. And uh, this guy is a, a, a listener, they're called listeners, in which you have to listen to the events that happen. The event, this click of a button sent, sends out a closed window event, and if I didn't have this in here, okay, this would just sit without any way of closing the window, okay? You can see this goes into a loop, and then you have to catch the close, or else you're going to never be able to close the soft piece of software. And I do have a catch-all, because, and don't put this in your final piece of software, but it's useful when you're developing when things are caught and um, you can see what, the, see what was grabbed. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Like 15, 20? Okay, cool. Um, uh, Oh, uh, I want to jump into a bunch of bunch of stuff about WX Erlang now. The um, uh, we have to thank um, Don Gudmundsson for redoing WX Erlang um, sometime. I think it's six, six, seven years ago. Um, he totally rewrapped it in a beautiful, um, elegant function structure, which we're going to go over in a second, and. Uh, yeah, thank you. We have, we have to thank him for the, the current version of WX Erlang. 
Um, but, but, but the, and as a beginner, if you come into WX Erlang, the, the functions are set up in a very specific fashion. They, um, let's go into WX frame. Oh, let's do the frame. That are cool. Okay, so most functions have this situation where they take something and uh, then they take mm -hmm. options. So they take the necessary arguments and then they take a list of arguments. Um, as the second argument. And, and this is a fantastic way to set up Erlang functions. Uh, th this is something I've come to real, you know, really take into my just fun overall functional programming was learning this setup because it's always good to add options in, in to the functions you're making. You can always make them extensible that way. Um, most all functions in WX Erlang um, look like this and follow this general setup. So if you can get used to that, then you can get used to programming WX Erlang rather uh, quickly. Now, I went through, um, the, the first thing I had to do to get over, uh, to get into the WX Erlang, because when I found it, there was, there was no documentation. Um, there was no, um, and, and it was very difficult to find any sort of, of backup. So I had to go into the WX Python um, manuals and actually kind of look back and forth to see how it was done. Um, I, I think, I assume Dan did such a good job when he was done with it, he's just like, I'm just gonna throw this out here because, um, and he didn't have time to actually document it. It's what it looks like. It looks like he put so much heart and soul into it that uh, when he was done, he was just like, okay, you know, I, I, I put too much time on making it technically beautiful. Um, so, uh, so I went through and I edited all the, uh, every one of the modules and I, by hand, I got a nice title and then there's specs and then there's the documentation and then there's the function. So if you, um, oh, the last thing I didn't show is if you go to my website, scriptculture.com, all these I'm, I'm releasing just one by one as I finalize them. Um, I've been releasing one every day for the entire year. Um, you know, within a couple months, we're gonna have the, all the libraries out there so that everyone can use this to quickly build. It's very effective going to the source code. Uh, through this process, I've, I've come to actually love editing code by hand. It's really cool making it legible and, and understandable. Um, uh, so I'm going to be continuing doing that also through all the other libraries that Erlang has. Uh, be tuned for that. Um, oh, also, uh, while I was searching around, uh, we have to thank Craig over in Japan. He did, a, he did a blog of some sort with a bunch of examples. That really helped me out. Like, thank you, Craig. That, that was great. Um, um, uh, what's next? Okay, so um, yeah, now I want to go through a litany of little things now just about WX Erlang uh, that you should, you should pay attention to. Um, one of them is memory leaks. If uh, you don't, if you create, because what's happening in WX Erlang is you're metaprogramming C++. Um, uh, you're gonna, you have to realize you are metaprogramming C++. And C++ doesn't have a nice trial. garbage collector like Erlang has. You have to delete everything you, you create. So everything that tends to have this create, something happens, and then you delete the thing you created. Um, know that. Um, don't overload your system when you're, when you're doing WX, because uh, you won't just seg fault, but sometimes you'll just crash the whole system. It's happened to me. Um, nothing bad, super bad's happened, but just be, be aware. Don't clock out your system when you're trying to do this stuff, because if there's a little memory leak, then you know whole system can go. Um, uh, let's go on to the next, next, next example. Okay, so um, uh, let, let's jump over these. Um, before the next example, let's talk about this for a second. What, is it, what does it look like? Okay, so here is uh, your vector graphics up here. And down here, this WXDC, is, here is all your raster graphics. What's a vector? What's raster? It's two different methods of actually programming graphics. Uh, your raster is a fancy way of saying bitmaps and squares. And the world is nothing but a bunch of squares and coordinates. A lot like a big table, like Excel or... Um, any table like that. I have to talk to people who don't know where I apologize, guys. Um, uh, a table like that. The, um, the vector, on the other hand, is a list of coordinates with, um, with floating numbers. And so you're going to see a whole bunch of, when, when you actually look at a, um, a vector graphic, you're going to see a whole bunch of numbers. Um, and this is, the, this vector uh, graphics leads into your 3D engines and leads into actually using your graphics, for, um, your um, graphics GPU, your graphics processor. And um, yeah, so let's look at the difference between the two in code and in an example. So here is uh, here's a paint example, okay, which is based on 
uh, WXDC and raster graphics. So it's just grabbing a random point and grabbing a random color and play, painting a circle in a random color on that frame I talked to you about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So if we look at this, we can see with, with raster graphics, we create this memory DC pair, okay? With a bitmap and then a memory DC. A memory DC is a, a bit of memory that you allocate and you draw to it and then you blit it to the screen, which is um, uh, a, a linear, bilinear transformation. Um, I probably got that wrong. Um, but it's, uh, uh, essentially it takes the one piece of memory and, and changes the pointers at it. And it's a lot cheaper than it is actually copying and pasting the whole memory. So most all graphics with raster are done like this, um, this the splitting method. Then, then here we have a clock just sending us a message. Um, uh, We'll come right back to here. You can see down here, each time it gets a message, okay, it creates a random number and uh, it calls this, this name paint event, okay? So and this is what you usually do. You, um, it, painting took me a while to figure out in, in WX because I was doing this totally blind and it was all trial and error. Um, down here, you, so what you do is you grab a, a message from external, from external message that from the Erlang side. Um, because with, with WX, we want to keep everything, at least my method, we want to keep the entire um, thread because C++ is all single threaded and this is just, we're not using multi-core here. We want to keep everything on one module. We don't want to do the Erlang thing and split it up. It's so much easier to keep everything in one, one gen server, excuse me, not gen server, it's a special process. And uh, send messages, messages to it over and over and over. And um, it's, it's easier to build when you have this thing in a single thread. Um, otherwise, you're gonna, later on you're going to deal with uh, something breaking when you have a bunch of gen servers and it becomes a nightmare to debug because what happened, what order. You know, I think, just send, it, send messages, group things together, and then send, send painting directions to WX. So here we grab this WX batch function. Um, you see we create the pen, and then down here we destroy the pen. Okay? In the center of it, we set the pen into the um, WXDC and the brush into WXDC before we draw the circle. Uh, which WXDC is just chock full of painting functions. Go explore it. It's a, it's a, you'll be using that a lot with raster. Um, and what this does is it triggers this anonymous function we threw up here, okay? This anonymous function, um, which is defined, you define in your initiation, uh, then gets triggered when you, uh, when you actually call this portion of it, um, would WX window refresh, okay, with the erase background false option, okay? Erase background false, WX automatically tries to paint the background. If you put this in, then you're gonna be responsible for, for basically repainting the destroyed version at, um, as it actually tries to paint again. So if you try to move something around the screen, we have to, you know, paint over what just got painted. Um, it's much, doing, with Erlang, it's much easier to do it with this method. This is the method you're gonna to wanna to use. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's uh, how we do it with, um, with raster. Um, oh, so then, excuse me, this triggers, this anonymous function up here then triggers the redraw, okay? Which then calls buffered paint DC, which then blitz it over to my memory DC. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, it blitz it from my memory DC to my DC. And that's happening each time the tick comes in. And that's what you're looking at right now. This is how we paint a screen. Um, uh, and then we have, of course, have to destroy the, the DC. I'm giving all this code out. You know, you guys can look at this later. You can mess with it later. This is generally how we paint. Um, if we want to make another frame, uh, then we need to make another, um, well, we don't need to. Um, I'm going to put tutorials online how to do this stuff. Um, let's, let's move on. Okay, so that if we want to use vector on the other hand, okay. Uh, oh, I compiled it. Path. There we go. Okay. Uh, exact same, if you actually, if you look at it very closely, you're gonna see it's a very, it's a little smoother on the outside than it is on the, um, on the paint we just had. The, the, this is vector graphics. These are painted differently. Um, to do vector graphics, what we do is we take and, I see everything looks the same. We, we start, start the instance, we get the timer. Um, to, now we start an instance of the graphics renderer. Um, and I believe we loop it too. Yep, we can see up here we loop it. 
then uh, we, we throw the connects as we should. This, um, this refresh actually is probably why the, it started fresh um, versus you're going to find if you paint and then restart the, because we have the server going and you restart the, the same instance, it's going to have all the crap you just painted from the, the previous attempt at it. So you're going to have to refresh out the old stuff. Um, that, these things took me a while to debug. Uh, and with each tick, instead we go and we do this, this whole bit. Um, I'm going to let you guys look at this. Uh, I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to let you guys look at this at your own time. Um, yeah. yeah. Generally, it's pretty explanatory if you just stare at it and see what, what's going on. You uh, need to create the path, and then you need to destroy everything afterwards. Um, again, common pattern. Uh, but there is another slide I want to go over. Generally, I think it's behind, behind this. Yep, here it is. OK, WX frame. So this is generally what we're doing. Um, I wish I had said this a while ago, but no, now it's better than ever. So you. As you continue, um, th this is my initiation function, got cut off on top, and then here's my loop, and then below it says library. This is generally how your WX Erlang script should be set up. Um, there's a large initiation, okay, and then there's going to be a large loop that we send messages to. Because it's a special process, we want to actually put all the special process goodies in. Um, go read about, go read uh, Loic's tutorial online, and then um, that'll help you do the or, or uh, Francesco's new book, looking at uh, special processes. This is one, so make sure you put that stuff in, because uh, you do have to clean up afterwards with the terminate function, um, which, let's go on to that. Uh, okay, this example, I, I was trying to desperately get this up before, the, uh, before this talk, but um, we can look at the script, because it's it's all it did was add a button. You're going to see it had two buttons. Hit the button, and then it basically took these button, these dice, and whatever the outcome of the dice were, it was it painted it on the screen. But we already saw we paint the screen. Uh, we'll go over it. But there's some. What I really want to show you now here is some some nice code that I wrote that will. You're going to love it. Okay, so. I'm going to go right down to the library section of this. Okay, because when you need to load images into the into, you need to create. You need to create the image. Uh, you have to create each memory DC, and you need to then load the image in. So I wrote these, these wrapper functions that help you basically, in the initiation, load in large swaths of images into your loop um, so that you don't have to do it over and over and over and over again. And um, you can see, here's uh, image initiation, OK? And look at this. Look at this um, format. It's the same thing. I, I, I tried to use the same thing that, that, that Don used, um, where we take a name and a path. This is, um, this is to do one. If we look up here, we're going to see this is just a, I think, a list comprehension. No, I, I took a, a function and I, I mapped the. So you, give it, you hand it a list, and then you do each image um, in order. So what we do here is we, um, uh, we suppress WX for a moment in this. This, this took me a while. Because each time you tried to load an image in, it was, it was giving me an error that um, each time for each image, it was throwing an error. Eventually, I found out, you know, um, in a bug deep in the WX libraries that we, um, well, that log null, um, that you, this is how you get rid of it. You have to actually suppress it for a second, load the images, and then stop the suppression. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm giving the code away. Uh, it's important for you guys to have this if you want to build some good stuff. Um, at the same token, it, it also calls down here, you can see um, a derived clipping mass region. Which will actually, if you can, if you hand it a PNG, um, it will be able to, you will be able to get the region from this as well. So you can actually draw um, and use mouse rollovers. Which writing the code to make a region um, was also equally tricky. Um, you guys can look at this later. I don't think you guys want to hear me explain it right now. Do you? No. Nod. Yes. No. No. Come on. Give me, give me something. Yes. Yes or no. No. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to do it right now. Either. You, you can look at this later. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, at the end, just be sure when you use these functions in the close, in the terminate, that you actually, um, or that close function I showed you, in the loop up here. Oh, and you, let's, let's look at these in action. So you can see I just load in all my dice. Okay. 
And then here I, I load in, this is how many I want. Um, for each frame I want, if I want to have multiple windows, you need to make a, a, a memory DC pair with a bitmap pair to actually have a new window. And you can, the main window you start with will be your top level window, and then you create a frame and you feed it um, each one of these new bitmaps as a, um, as a base. And you can draw to them the same way you would draw to the main screen. Um, um, uh, I also threw in, in this example a little bit of a uh, menu. If you want to make a menu, this is how you do it. You start a, you say, you make the menu and then you append all your, your menu items to it. Um, and then you go ahead and uh, uh, put all those into the menu bar up on top. So this actually will then put them into this, this, uh, this bar on the top. And so you guys can make menus. And, and menus with Erlang is extremely important because uh, when, as I looked at Erlang, Erlang um, it seems to be Erlang is very good at binding to things. Um, and that's what makes it s such a badass programming language is that you can just, um, you can just bind to um, uh, any API that anything else will have. You can take the binaries and bind to it. I, I think the future of Erlang and the future of you guys programming WX is going to be looking at different problems and binding to those problems. And then Erlang over time is going to actually, we're going to have to deal with depicting the truth because Erlang being the puppeteer of the, of the different APIs or the translator be between the different programming languages are going to have to deal with um, the, uh, you know, it's going to have to deal with actually showing it to the user in a representationally faithful way. Um, here's how you make a status bar at the bottom. And there's the logic from it. Uh, da, da, da. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. Um, well, when you adopt a tool, you also adopt the management philosophy embedded in that tool. Um, the tool that we've all chosen, the weapon, is Erlang. And any tool that you pick up, any language that you pick up, you're also, you realize you're also adopting the management philosophy that's embedded in that tool. Um, it becomes part of you whether you like it or not. Um, uh, th this, this quote's by Clay Shirky, who did a great TED talk in about 2010. Um, it, uh, it talked about GitHub and why the government can, you know, uh, should get on board with you know, having diffs and whatnot uh, in, our own, in our own law. It's, it's worth, worth a search and a look. But um, uh, Erlang is a good, I, I believe Erlang is a good thing. Uh, and it's a good tool. And, uh, I openly accept the uh, management philosophy embedded in it because it's representationally faithful. Yeah, you can go on. <laughs> I, um, I guess questions, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I can hand those out. Yeah, I, um, I made a, uh, the, the gift I, I talked about earlier is, is this. It's, all the Erlang polymorphisms in a cool little circle that you can have and carry around and see uh, how the actual po uh, how Erlang actually polymorphs the, or morphs the data back and forth. It's one of Erlang's strongest abilities um, is that it can transform any data type into any other, or basically into any other data type uh, given you, you have, if you want to do so, and have the grit. Yeah. How do we find your website? Uh, it's scriptculture.com. Um, Search it or type it in the, in the URL bar, as it sounds. It's on the disk component. Yep. Very small. Nice. Yeah. And the code you mentioned, is it also on that website? Yeah, I'll, I'll post it probably. In, I, I want to make that dice example work, and then I'll post it all up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, look at that code. The, that painting function, you need all, all four of those parts I, I showed you.